Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cataraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. We highlight the voices of Native activists, writers, poets, artists, thinkers, and musicians who are fighting for the rights of Indigenous people all over Turtle Island. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. In this moment of historical change and social justice, our voices matter now more than ever before. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Hey everyone, welcome to the program. Uh, I am John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Uh, got a, uh, an interesting show. It's it's a bit controversial, um, but what what isn't <laughs> as far as the things that I bring up here? And uh, you know, the, the thing I want to be real clear here is I am not condemning our athletes. I am not condemning the team that represents uh, the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Nationals. Um, not crazy about the name, but, uh, but that's a whole other issue. But I, I want to talk about the future of this team, of the Iroquois Nationals, or a team that represents the Haudenosaunee. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how, how many people are following what's basically been transpiring for years, but we've run into a bunch of issues. Uh, among those issues has been uh, our our ability, not just as a, as a lacrosse team, but uh, even as individuals, to travel internationally. Um, we uh, there there are Haudenosaunee passports, and since nine eleven and the uh, you know the big push for homeland security and what they call the Western Hemisphere wait, wait Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative I call it Whitey but Western <laughs> Hemisphere Travel Initiative um, it is been increasingly difficult to travel. Hell, it's even tr tough to cross the, the, the U.S.-Canadian border, uh, the border they stuck between our territories. Um, we have had, you know, Canadian customs actually confiscate these, uh, these Haudenosaunee passports, calling them, you know, fake documents and that kind of stuff. Uh, it has been almost impossible to travel on them. Uh, for one thing, it is difficult to leave the United States or Canada to another country. They check your travel documents. And it's almost like they, they well, it's not almost, they actually stop you from being able to, to travel to another country. Now, in the other countries, they have, a, they have an issue if the United States isn't recognizing the, uh, the documents that you're traveling on or, the, or Canada. The question that, that uh, these other countries, these host countries, um, have to face is, well, what are they going to do with, with a team that, that um, may be stranded there? So, I mean, but we'll, we'll get in, into all of it. But look, beyond the question uh, you know, as to where lacrosse comes from, uh, there, there oftentimes is a debate. I think it is pretty well established that, um, and recognized that lacrosse is uh, is a sport that uh, was developed um by the Haudenosaunee uh it's it's a part of our culture it's our game um eh, there's some people who get into where the game comes did we invent it was it a gift from the creator um uh, I kind of pass on the latter I think our people are are certainly intelligent enough to develop a sport um has the sport evolved um uh, over the years, absolutely. Um, we actually became, uh, we, we, we actually pushed forward the idea of box lacrosse, which is played, you know, more like on a, on a, a hockey rink size, uh, but it's, it's played with walls around it, which is, wasn't the origins of our game. This was a game that didn't necessarily have an out of bounds. It had goals, but it, uh, it didn't necessarily have um, 
an out of bounds line. Um, so as, as the as the game was refined by us and others, uh, we have lost significant um, influence over the game. Now, having said that, we still maintain um, among the best athletes in the world uh, for playing for competing in lacrosse, uh, and we can actually field one of the best teams in the world still, even though we're fielding a team from a tremendously small population compared to the United States or Canada or, or any, any country. And as it stands now, we are consistently the third best uh, team in the world. Usually, well, uh, usually third be behind either Canada and the United States or United States and Canada. Uh, in any of these events where there was, uh, you know, medals to be awarded, the, the Iroquois Nationals have consistently uh, taken bronze. Uh, they've done better than that in the past, but um, as U.S. and Canada, because of, you know, if, if for no other reason, because of the, the sheer population they get to draw from, and, you know, we, we did a good job promoting this game. It is, it is something that many schools, high schools, you know, non-native schools, I mean, uh, Long Island is famous for having some, some great lacrosse teams uh, down there. And, and I'm not talking about native territories. Um, Ivy League schools really uh, uh, took a real um, position with, with lacrosse as, uh, as, as a sport. And now it's a, it's a, it's a major NCAA uh, Division I uh, program. One that Syracuse University has won uh, you know, in, the, in the, the NCAA tournament uh, several times. But we can consistently put some of the best athletes out there and right from this territory. Uh, you know, Zaddy Williams comes to mind, but there have, been, there have been great athletes that have come from, again, very, very small population centers, you know, by comparison to, to what's out there in the world. Um. And, and again, we, so we, we consistently can field a very competitive team, a team that, you know, oftentimes runs neck and neck with, uh, you know, with the United States and Canada uh, as, as far as national teams go um, for, you know, through, through much, of a, much of the competition. Ultimately, usually we, we fall back and, uh, and, and then get overtaken by U.S. and Canada. But... But that's the only two teams that, are, that really have overtaken us. But I will say, as this sport is become more international and more and more teams field, uh, more and more nations field teams, uh, nations with much larger populations, they're going to they're going to get more and more competitive, and it is going to be harder and harder to even may, uh, maintain a third place ranking. So, but as it stands today, there's no question that. Our, uh, we can field a team of world-class caliber. And, and look, the standard shouldn't be can you, can you medal to compete. But the, the reality is we can, we can field a team that will medal uh, and, and do it fairly consistently. But the problem is this, um, there are international standards that have been created. And beyond the passport issue and the, the ability to travel – the uh, what are they call the International um, uh, World um, Championship Association, the IWCA, I think is what it's called. They um, they have established these these criterion, and they basically told the Iroquois Nationals that they didn't meet the requirements, that they don't they don't qualify. And the two reasons they said they don't qualify is because they. Um, they don't, or they don't represent a sovereign nation, which is something that you know. Look, we're always arguing. I mean, that's part of the reason the whole passport issue and our ability to create our own travel documents. It, it you know, we we've been utilizing sports to make a political stand, um, not very successfully as of late. But that's the argument. That's what the the international. Um, uh, World Games Association. That's what it is. The, World, the International World Games Association. That's what they're saying. They said the, uh, the uh, Iroquois Nationals do not represent a sovereign nation and they don't have an Olympic committee. Now, the latter probably sounds like something easy to solve, but there's a whole lot that goes into that too. So the question, you know, the, the question can become, are they creating the, these standards so it's impossible for us to meet it? 
the next World Cup games or World Championship is being played, um, I think, in, what did they say, in Alabama, I think, um, in uh, 2022. And the Iroquois Nationals weren't invited uh, to compete. And it makes, no, it makes news. Look, many of the teams that do compete, they do like competing. They, they, they want the Iroquois Nationals to be one, uh, one of the comp uh, competitors. But the... Again, the politics and the bureaucracy of this stuff says now they, they don't qualify. You know, they, they, they simply are ineligible. And this uh, uh, IWGA, they actually backed off of that and said, well, yeah, look, you weren't invited. Um, if we could fit you in, if we could make room for you, we would uh, we'd consider, um, you know, reversing that. So then Ireland said, well, then we won't go. So Ireland, and look, there's some history between Ireland and, and, and Native people, you know, um, the relationship that, that has cut both ways uh, um, between help that uh, uh, specific Native uh, nations like the Choctaw uh, helped when Ireland was going through its potato famine and stuff like that. And then even recently with the COVID-19 situation, the uh, uh, Ireland made some significant contributions to Navajo territory in their battle with, with COVID-19. So there's, there's, there's kind of been an interesting relationship, but, but Ireland said, no, we will withdraw. We'll, we will withdraw from the, the world games uh, to make room for the, uh, for the Iroquois nationals. Now I got to admit that I'm of the opinion that that kind of sucks. And I don't, I mean, honestly, I think it would have been great if a bunch of these teams said, no, we will boycott the, uh, the world games. If, the Iroquois Nationals aren't allowed, but yeah, and this is the, you know you know we get into politics and sports here, but I think for Ireland solely to withdraw and make a space, I mean yeah, the Iroquois Nationals can field a team and go play in Alabama or wherever wherever the this competition is going to be, but it doesn't change that they weren't invited in the first place, even though they are certainly of world class caliber. Um, I don't know. I, I, I know people have different feelings about uh, about competing where you're not wanted. I mean, look. Let me let me back up here. the The Iroquois Nationals were invited to compete in 2010 uh, for the world, uh, you know, the World Games in Manchester, England, but then weren't able to because the United States wouldn't let them uh, travel. To, uh, to Manchester, England on Haudenosaunee passports. Ironically, at that time, Hillary Clinton was the uh, Secretary of State. And when push comes to shove, she, she backed out a little bit. She said, well, how about if we, um, we issue a waiver and we let you go? Um, we won't require that you have a U.S. or Canadian passport, but um, we're still not going to recognize your passports. And... Um, the powers that be, the people who, who really managed uh, and were the decision makers for the Iroquois National said, no, that's not good enough. And, and, and here's the other crazy part. How much pushback was there from, say, England? And I, and I bring this up because 2010 was also the, the time when um, the United States was supposed to be uh, uh, revisiting the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, peoples. And England was one of the, the nations that signed that. Only four um, voted no against, and that was the United States, um, Canada, New Zealand, uh, and Australia. Those are the only four nations that voted against the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, and they voted against it because they were afraid it was going to affect not just international law, they were afraid it was going to affect their laws and, and their prejudicial laws. Um, but Countries who did sign it still never really would step up, and, and including England. Uh, so the Iroquois Nationals didn't go to, to Manchester, uh, Manchester, England, and compete. Uh, I think Oren Lyons might have, you know, did some, I don't know if he went there and spoke or, or somehow spoke, you know, uh, on the Jumbotron or whatever else and gave an impassioned speech and that kind of stuff. But, you know, and, and it's, it's funny because, you know, he thanked the committee and all that other stuff. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, there's platitudes that are shared, but the you know again the uh, IGWA, the International World Games Association, and the the Federation for uh, International Federation for Lacrosse, they they don't step up enough. 
and and so the Iroquois Nationals continues to be you know, somewhat marginalized politically, not competitively, but but politically. Uh, so more recently than that, just a couple of years ago, the um, uh, the Iroquois Nationals were, were going to go compete in indoor lacrosse, uh, the World Games, which is not as, um, it's probably not quite as competitive, and there's not as many uh, um, nations that field in, in, uh, indoor lacrosse teams as they do field lacrosse. Um, but, uh, but this was going to be played somehow, for whatever reason, Israel managed to uh, uh, gain the, uh, the spot and, and, uh, to host these games. Now, there was a lot of controversy over whether the, the Iroquois Nationals should have gone to Israel. And I think even within the, the organization, you know, from what I understand, it was not widely embraced by some of the powers that be, like Orin Lions and others. And, and at least that's the way it was told to me. But, uh, and, and I know across, certainly across um, Native communities, I mean, uh, and many communities that were... Uh, really pushing the whole BDS, the boycott, uh, uh, divest, and, and sanction Israel because of the treatment of, of Palestinians. There was a lot of reasons not to go. But, you know, certain powers that be made the decision, yes, uh, the Iroquois Nationals are going to go to Israel to play in these, uh, these games. Uh, they all got suited up. They all got loaded up, packed up, went to Toronto to get on an airplane to go to Israel, and they were held up. Canada refused to let them travel on their Iroquois, uh, their Haudenosaunee, I'm sorry, Haudenosaunee passports. So they were stuck. Now, Israel also wouldn't issue a travel visa for the uh, Iroquois nationals and, and, the, and the team and the staff and everything else until Canada would, you know, agreed to recognize their, their passports, and Canada wouldn't. So Israel negotiated... Not even with, with anybody from the, the Haudenosaunee, no Confederacy people, but between Israel and Canada, they, they negotiated a, a, a way around this, a workaround. And ironically, the workaround was the same one that Hillary Clinton offered, uh, you know, uh, eight years prior. They, uh, Canada said they'd, they'd issue a waiver basically saying that the, the, um, this team could travel to Israel without an internationally recognized passport. Now, I know that there are powers that be within the Haudenosaunee, within you know, around different territories. Oh no, they travel on their on their Haudenosaunee passports. No, they traveled with them, <laughs> but they didn't travel on them. They traveled on a waiver, on a waiver that wasn't even negotiated by them. It was negotiated between Israel and uh, and, and Canada, and so they went and they went and and, I, and again, I think they took third place. Um, and there were you know some very good games and uh, but uh, so they again they went they went and they played in Israel, but that problem persists. Look, look and it's not just the men either. The, uh, the 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 women who don't play as the Iroquois Nationals, and I'll talk about the name perhaps later in the show. They they uh, travel and play as Team Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee women um, they couldn't uh, compete. In um, I think it was also in, in, in England, I believe, might have been, might have been Scotland. I don't remember, but they were they were gonna uh, th they were denied the right to go compete in um, uh, in international competitions. Ironically, <laughs> they um, that their um, battle with with international travel on the Haudenosaunee passports happened at the same time that, that Syracuse and to some extent Onondaga was hosting. Um, the uh, the indoor lacrosse uh, world or world cup I guess uh, a few years back, um, but they couldn't even talk about it. You know, Onondaga, you know, and uh, was kind of this in the spotlight because they were they and the city of Syracuse were hosting um, you know many of these games. Uh, the championships were being played in Syracuse, but some of the um, the other down bracket games were being played right in Onondaga. Um, Onondaga even uh, set up a tent to stamp passports, although I don't think Canada um, and certainly the United States players didn't, didn't have their passports stamped by, the, uh, uh, by Onondaga. Um, so there was an attempt to try to politicize, um, and I don't mean in a bad way. I'm not saying, I'm not condemning the idea of promoting and pushing this passport issue and using sports. I, there's a place where, where it is somewhat troublesome, but... Um, I don't think it's inappropriate to, to utilize sports. 
uh, for, for political reasons. I don't. Um, but, um, but so this, this, this problem persists. And, and like I said, when it came to uh, the, uh, the Iroquois Nationals going to Israel just a couple of years ago, uh, it was uh, it was widely widely suggested that they did travel on their uh, Haudenosaunee passports, uh, but that's not true. I'll also mention that that several of the players and um, staff, uh, you know, a, a team staff, do have Canadian and U.S. passports, and which kind of gets into a strange. Um, that's a that's a, another strange political statement. So this is where it, it's all kind of mired in, in this kind of controversy. And again, I've got to reiterate, and I'll do it probably several times through the program, that we have some tremendous uh, lacrosse players from our, from our territories. And, and look, Senecas, Onondagas, Mohawks, Oneidas, I mean, uh, Cayugas, we have, we have great, all of our, the, you know, the, the six nations have some some great um, uh, great lacrosse players, and there's no denying. It. And and on either side of that imaginary line too. So um, our team is you know we can field a team from our territories that are very competitive, but that competition is getting tougher. It's getting tougher. As as I mentioned earlier, we're pulling um, a world class team together from. Very small communities by comparison. I mean, look, New York City's got uh, 10 million people in its metropolitan area. Uh, we, <laughs> I think we have 100,000. Uh, if, if you count all of our ter- territories together, I don't think we're, we're much more than 100,000. If I'm off, then you know, somebody can correct me online, I guess. But uh, um, yeah, we've, a, we've got a pretty small population to pull from compared to these other, uh, not just the United States and Canada, to the other countries who are becoming more and more competitive. So where that where is that going to leave us going forward? I, I think it is it's somewhat problematic. Um, look, if we want to take a a journey back in time to look at um, where some of our premier athletes have shined in the inter- international competition. Um, it was always playing for the United States or Canada. Jim Thorpe. You know, wins both the pentathlon and the decathlon. What was it, in 1912 or something like that? Um, by many accounts, um, the greatest athlete in the history of, uh, of, of, of sports coming from, from, he was Sack and Fox, went to school at one of those residential schools, Carlisle Indian School, uh, was just a phenomenal athlete. But he couldn't compete for Sack and Fox, uh, even though it was, a, it was an individual um, uh, sport, the pentathlon, and the, uh, this wasn't a team sport, but he had to compete for the United States, you know, on behalf of the United States. Billy Mills, again, track and field, he, uh, he had to run for Team USA. And, you know, one of the most spectacular races in the history, uh, you know, of, of track and field. His come from behind win was just, I think it was in Mexico, if I'm not mistaken, but um, just, just incredible. I mean, I, I still get chills when I watch that, uh, watch that race. <clears throat> um, but uh, Alan Morris, who uh, won um, gold medal in uh, in the two man canoe race um, uh, for for Canada? He's he's gonna walk in Mohawk, but he uh, he had to he had to compete for Canada. Wanique Horn Miller. Now Wanique Horn Miller is she was stabbed by a bayonet in the Gunasadage Oka crisis. Somebody who literally was injured by Canada over the, over the standoff uh, from Gunasadage, the poster behind me right here, and she was a great swimmer. She uh, she played water polo and she um, she played on Team Canada. So when I look at where our athletes, when they've wanted to compete at the highest level, they. Even in, in some of the more individual sports, they had to um, they had to you know compete under you know, four. They actually had to represent Canada or the United States, and that gets me to a tough spot with the uh, with the Iroquois Nationals and with, with our great athletes because at some point, by continually being denied, um, if I mean look if if lacrosse ever becomes a 
uh, an Olympic sport, which it's probably on track to become one, we probably won't be able to compete in that. Not as a team, not, a, not as a Haudenosaunee team. So will our great athletes have to concede and play for USA or Canada? I mean, I can't blame them for doing it. Just like I, I don't blame, you know, you know, Thorpe, Miller, you know, um, uh, Wanique or, or, or Alan Morris. I don't, I don't blame them. They, there were, weren't all, a whole lot of options. But the crazy thing is there was an, an effort. There's been an ongoing effort to establish, at least in this one sport, the sport that was ours, is ours, that we have a right to compete. International and not just the right to to show up, but that we can feel the team. But that's going to be a hard thing to do if we can if we are both um, beat up politically, violate you know violated you know. Look, I made I I give a whole speech at the United Nations <laughs> where I talked about the fact that trying to force us to get a U.S. or Canadian passport is denationalization. It is genocide. Because you're forcing us to, to travel on your document and to forsake our own identity and grab yours for the purpose of, of travel. Now, it would be different if we could travel on a U.S. or Canadian passport and not have to claim U.S. or Canadian citizenship. But that's not the way it works. So this is, is a really, really big problem. And I don't see it, co it going well for us. I mean, even as we have support from other teams, even other countries, those countries won't cross the United States and Canada. Israel wouldn't issue a travel visa for the Iroquois nationals until Canada gave them permission to leave. And, and look, I'm not a big fan of Israel anyway, but you know, they, England wouldn't do it either. They're just not that bold. And the, the United States has its way with other nations when it comes to some of this international stuff. All right, hey, well, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we'll, we'll take a break when come, and then come back. I Look, I'll, I want to talk a little bit about the name. I, I kind of alluded to it, but, but I also want to go farther with this whole subject. And, you know, it, 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 this, this one tears me up. This one tears me up. So uh, we'll talk about it when we come back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Hey, I want to give a shout out to my sponsors. I want to thank Ross and Holly John, and I want to wish a, a, a get well, I guess, to, to Ross. I understand he was uh, he was undergoing some surgery, I guess. So um, my, my get well wishes to Ross. Um, I want to thank uh, Eric White and ERW Enterprises, and I want to thank the, the folks at Grand River Enterprises for uh, you know for the, the support week to week, month to month. Um, it, it enables us to keep doing what we're doing. I also want to thank all of you, uh, the rest of you who are out there, either your, your, the Patreon subscribers. The, the, I got a few that um, make contributions via PayPal. I have a few that drop a check in the mail from time to time. I want to thank all of you because uh, this, is, this is how we pay for what we do here. So I want to thank all of you. Um, this, I think what we're doing here is important work and your support enables us to do it. So, Nyawe. Um Oh, yeah, there you go. You can find us on Patreon <laughs> by going to, uh, I mean, I, I've got it written down someplace, but let me, let me give it, a, it's um, uh, patreon.com slash let's talk native. Did I get that right? All right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so patreon.com slash let's talk native. You can go there and you can become, uh, you know, pick a tier and become a uh, Patreon subscriber. And uh, we'll talk about that more in future shows because, uh, look, this is kind of the way things are going. And one of the things that I that I like about uh, about Patreon and or or any or, or donations in general, to me it's a, it's an indication that you are uh, supporting the content. Uh, look, you know we can we can sell things and give things away and try to raise money doing various other things, but at the end of the day, and we do have T-shirts by the way, you can find them on our, on our website. But um, uh, 
but at the end of the day, it's it's the content that we're really trying to put uh, put out there. And so when you subscribe um, to, to Patreon or when you send in a donation, or, you know, or for those the, the few regular sponsors we have, uh, you guys give pretty good, uh, strong indication about how you feel about the content that we're providing. So um, uh, again, thank you. Um, hey, if you're not subscribed to our podcast or podcasts, and you can find that on any of your podcast platforms, um, or to our YouTube channel, you may be missing some content, you know, so I actually suggest you do both. I mean, the nice thing about a podcast, is you can listen to it anywhere. You don't have to, you can do it while you're driving. The nice thing about YouTube channel, which is let's talk native TV. We have other videos on there that are not necessarily, um, captured in audio for podcasts so there's some content that you're only going to get on youtube and of course uh if you subscribe to our podcasts by and you can search let's talk native with john kane podcast you can ask alexa or your smart speaker or you can just search google search and you can find it and go to our website our website's got a, a bunch of the the links to uh some of the platforms it's also got links to our, our youtube channel and, and a few other things so go to our, our um, website which is www.letstalknative.com that makes sense right <laughs> let's talk native so uh so check it out all right so i am talking about the future of the iroquois national and my concern for it and you know, but I, you know i alluded to it but let me let me talk about the name i'm not crazy about the name for one thing iroquois is not our word it's you know it's kind of like being called an indian um it's a, it's a french word it, um but look i know some of these words become part of our vernacular but there's also uh, it's also on us to make the corrections over time. So we dropped the word Indian. We dropped the word tribe. We dropped the, the uh, you know, the, the word reservation. Um, uh, we are, we are even cautious when, when people want to use words like Native American or indigenous. We, we feel like we've got to always make sure that people understand that some of those words like Native American, you know, it assumes that we're Americans. Well, not necessarily. Indigenous, the problem with that word is that uh, it, it, in the international definition, it refers to us as almost as descendants of a people who predate colonialism. Well, we're not descendants. We are those people. So there, there are certain words that we, we feel like we have to, if we're going to use them, we've got to spend some time, you know, discovering how even words like Mohawk and, and, uh, and Seneca not necessarily our words. So we have to explain. We mean Gunyagahag or, or Onundawaga. Or we use Ungwe Ungwe as a word to describe who we are. But, you know, and I do that on the show. But so when I, when, when I think about the, the name for the, for the Haudenosaunee team and being called the Iroquois Nationals, I, even the word nation and nationals is, is sometimes you know, problematic. I mean, frankly... Uh, to be called uh, the Haudenosaunee or Team Haudenosaunee, to me, would, would be, is a better name. I, I don't understand why we are still um, using the name Iroquois Nationals. And I get it. Some people feel like they branded it, and it's, um, you know, it's like you, you can't change. Well, we, we, we can ask the Washington football team to change its brand. I, I, I think that we could be more responsible with our own. So, again, that's my own pet peeve about the name. It has nothing to do about how I feel about the guys who play on the team. And, and I, look, this, this team has been around for, for many, many years. Um, and look, the, the team has always had some great players. Um, but at this point now, we have some of the best athletes that, 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 that have ever played, that ever played for the, uh, the Iroquois Nationals. And they are uh, finely tuned athletes. They aren't just guys who are taking an international trip. They aren't the partiers. They aren't the, uh, you know, the rabble rousers that eh, some of the earlier versions of the Iroquois Nationals were. Um, these guys represent us in uh, in very good way. In a very good way. Uh, I'm proud of how they carry themselves. How, and, and of course, I'm proud of how they perform. But again, as long as we're going to continue to be facing these kinds of obstacles put in front of us by these international um, uh, agencies. I mean, the, the, the Olympic Committee. I mean, I don't know that we can even get through that hurdle that they're going to put on us. It, it, because when the uh, International World Games Association says, says the Iroquois Nationals uh, don't, or, or, you know, are ineligible because of two reasons. One, they don't, as far as they're concerned, they don't represent a sovereign nation. 
um, and that they don't have an Olympic committee. I, I, even the whole, do they represent a sovereign nation? Look, the Haudenosaunee is not a nation that is defined in the same way that, uh, that other nations define themselves. And the idea that we have to fit into that box, it's, it's known who we are. I mean, they know who we are. The United States knows what and who the Haudenosaunee is. Canada knows. This isn't, you know, like we're trying to present something that they've never heard of. So it's got a bullshit on a couple of different levels. Um, but as long as we're going to keep facing this obstacle, it is not only going to be harder and harder to, um, to compete internationally, which if you don't, you're going to lose that edge. But at some point, our athletes are going to say, you know what? I just want to play lacrosse. And, and, and they don't want to, it's not that they want to give up on their identity as, as, as Haudenosaunee, as Ungwe Ungwe. No, they don't. But this has been kind of the trap that we've been stuck into for, for many, many years. And the hope was that the Iroquois Nationals, a team Haudenosaunee, would be able to break down that barrier. And, you know, it, it, look, we, as I said earlier, we have a very small population uh, pool to pull our, our athletes from. If we lose even a couple of them who say, hell with it, I'm going to go play for Canada. Or hell with it, I'm going to play for the United States. Or you know, who knows, maybe they'll play for another, uh, another international team. Who knows? But um, if that happens, it becomes increasingly difficult. And I think that the future of the uh, Iroquois Nationals, Team Haudenosaunee, is, uh, is really in danger. Uh, it would be great to see a stronger push from the international communities to, to step up, but they have, they've been hesitant to do so. We don't get a whole lot of movement out of the UN. I encourage you, you can look at, I posted recently the, uh, my, uh, what I presented to the UN a couple of years ago. In fact, Ed Schindler went down with me. Um, I posted, uh, actually Jake pulled a video from the UN, um, uh, video footage, uh, my statements that I, that I read and that I gave to the, uh, to the panel at the, uh, World Indigenous Peoples Day, I think it was 2018. Uh, message wasn't very well received by the panel. It was well, well received by the people in the audience. But I, and I talked about the uh, the Iroquois nas uh, nationals and, and the problems with traveling internationally. But I don't see the inter the UN stepping up either. I mean, they've had this, you know. Um, uh, you know, special uh, forum for in, in, um, indigenous uh, uh, issues um, at the UN, but it hasn't um, it hasn't materialized in any tangible um, solutions for failure of nations to abide by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. There's nothing punitive. I mean, it is, is essentially it's an aspirational document with no force of law or, or no or no force of of anything. So. It's nice to have a standard, even though it's, it is the minimum standard for the way these, the, the international community, the nation states of the, of the United Nations are supposed to behave, but there's nothing that makes them do that. And it has been increasingly difficult for us to not only have an audience, I mean, I was shut down uh, you know, at, when, I, when I spoke there, and, and I know others, even if they get a platform, it, it's sometimes uh, you know just words that go into the ether, right? And so um, it's, it's very, very difficult. But I think we are, we are getting to a crossroads with some of this. And, and I don't know what the solution is. I think we have to organize um, what we're doing with our athletes. I mean, look, we don't have our own, our own high schools. So our kids are playing when they when they play sports at the, at, at the, um, um, at the high school level, they're playing, you know, on, on teams that are predominantly, you know, um, white teams, white schools, you know, we, our kids might represent, you know, 20 or 30% of a, uh, of a population in some school districts. And that, that's a high percentage. It's, it's probably much lower than that. Um, and we may, you know, put the starting five out on a basketball team. And we may put uh, many of the starting players out on a, on, on a lacrosse team. Um, but we're playing for, you know, for a non-native team for all intents and purposes. When we, when our athletes show their, their prowess and they, and they go off to play, uh, at college, uh, division one or wherever, they're going to be playing, um, 
on, on teams that are non-native teams. So to tell those athletes who played on, you know, on non-native for non-native high schools and non-native universities, obviously, that they can't play for U.S. or Canada, I think that's that's I won't take that stand. So I I think we're seeing the idea of us trying to field a team, use that team to advance some uh, you know a little bit of a political agenda when it comes to the to the passports. I see that as as something that. Um, that we're we're not winning we're not winning that battle and it, and it and it really sucks because we were you know prior to 9/11 uh, it it wasn't that difficult to for people to travel with a Haudenosaunee passport I will say the Haudenosaunee passport there's there's a couple of problems with it and and one of which is the gatekeepers for those passports. Uh, if you can play lacrosse really good, you can get a passport. It doesn't matter if you're – I mean, I've, I've heard people from Onondaga say that, well, uh, Cattaraugus is not uh, part of the Haudenosaunee. Wait, wait, what? Yeah, they said, well, they, they, they've got an elected style government and um, uh, the only nations that are really Haudenosaunee and – and I've heard Orrin Lines himself say this – or are Tuscarora, Tonawanda, and Onondaga. I mean, even uh, – you know, they even kind of snub, uh, you know, the, the – the one longhouse, at least, up in in uh, in Alquisasne. Uh and that's pretty problematic. And I'm not saying that it's like you have to be in good standing with Anadaga, essentially, to to get a get a passport. And I'm not saying that's you know, that's not without some exception, but it is not easy to just um, assert that you are Haudenosaunee and get a Haudenosaunee passport. And look, these the bottom lines; these are supposed to be used for identification. Now. There has been some effort to um, to change the passports and conform to uh, international standards, which is may not be a terrible thing. But I'll, I'll take it back a step. Um, even when it comes to identifications, you know, basic identifications, the United States approved uh, or they've uh, they pushed this enhanced driver's license thing. Which uh, has an RFID chip on it, and um, and obviously it's it, it's got a photo that uh, uh, conforms to their their uh, their database for facial recognition, um, you know, and has it has all the necessary. It's scannable and all that other stuff. So then they approved an enhanced what they call an enhanced tribal card, and the problem with the enhanced tribal card is that it no longer is our card for identification. It's theirs that we get to put Seneca Nation on. Or you know Saint Regis, you know Mohawks, or something like that on it. It is again the the five criterion for for these cards was that they had to you had to assert that you were either a U.S. or a Canadian citizen to get one. The the very first thing you had to do was prove bring your birth certificate to show that you were a U.S. or Canadian citizen to get an enhanced tribal card. I mean if you're if you um, are a quote unquote enrolled Seneca. But you were born on the Canadian side. Uh, you can have a little Canadian flag on your uh, enhanced tribal card issued by the Seneca Nation, you know. And, and of course, that's, that would be true of any uh, uh, any nation, right? So the first thing is that you you almost immediately out of the gate got to um, say, no, you're the member of a tribe, but you're a citizen of one of, uh, of the United States or, or, or Canada. Which is obviously problematic. The other thing is that they have an RFID chip, which which they can scan. We don't have you know readers for RFID chips. This is for them. It has to have a a, a scannable a code, um, and that's for them. What information they build up in, in uh, electronically from that chip or from that uh, that code, that information is not available to us or the nation that issues it. So they build an, an electronic file based on using the cards that they authorized uh, under their Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative. Like I said, I call them the Whitey, whitey cards. Um, so again, scannable strip, RFID chip, um, declaration of citizenship. It also has to have the same kind of photo that, that meets the, uh, the United States database requirements for their facial recognition technology. Uh, and then it has to have a, an expiration date, so you have to update that photo on a regular basis, so they can, you know, they can keep, make, keep better tabs on us. And, I mean, it's not just that it, that it has to be a um, 
a valid ID. No, they have. They want it to work for them. They want our cards to work for them. Well, and see, that's kind of what's happened with passports. Uh, and the idea of, of switching over to electronic passports, th some countries have, have hesitated. Some countries said, no, there was nothing wrong with the paper ones that we stamped. And so it, it has been, it's, it's been a debate. I know that there was some effort, um, I think in Onondaga, to update and upgrade the, uh, the Haudenosaunee passports. But my fear was that they were going to, again, slip them under, um, uh, you know, like the, like the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative uh, cards, the, the enhanced travel cards, that they would essentially still assert U.S. or Canadian citizenship. Now, I said at the beginning, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem traveling with a, with a U.S. passport if I could say that I'm not a U.S. citizen on it. If I could, if I could, you know, I don't mind using their infrastructure. That's that's pretty well recognized. But I want to be able to say that I'm Ganya Gahaga, that I'm holding a shoni, that I'm Ongwe The better thing would be not just to have holding a shoni passports, but for each nation to be able to issue their let the Seneca Nation issue a passport, let the the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, and and we could make sure that those that their association is is recognized as as a uh, as Haudenosaunee but they should be issued um at at you know by uh, again by the by the governments of uh of, of our territories and that way you don't get into the politics of who gets one and who doesn't get one and it shouldn't be based on your lacrosse skills so um i think there were some times where um certainly in relationships with uh, with countries that are not necessarily favored nations by the United States, like Cuba or Venezuela, uh, it would it would be it'd be great to say, look, we're not bound by U.S. law if we if we want to travel to countries that 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 you have a problem with, and and that would be really the assertion of sovereignty. And and this is where the intersection of of sports, international sports, and uh, and politics, and and you know our assertion of sovereignty come into play. I'm not opposed to to utilizing. Look, I, I think there there comes a time that it makes sense for a nation to boycott the Olympics, and you know, and there have been good reasons to do so. Um, does it hurt athletes? Yes, of course it does. And but from a from a native standpoint, from a Haudenosaunee standpoint, look, we're in a constant struggle. We, you know, we we can't seem to get nations out of their own way when it comes to some of this stuff. And like I said. You talk to any of the the, team, the nations that are fielding teams of lacrosse and, and ask them if they were able to vote on it, they would probably say, absolutely, we want the, uh, the uh, Haudenosaunee team there. But that's not the way it works out. And there isn't enough solidarity amongst uh, lacrosse teams or you know, other nations uh, to say, no, either the standard's going to change or none of us are going to compete. And, you know, I, I realize that's a, that's a pretty tall order. That's, that's a lot to ask of, uh, uh, you know, of, of um, not just nations, but the athletes of those nations. I mean, many of these, these, you know, these men and women dedicate major parts of their lives to, uh, you know, to be, you know, becoming these superior athletes, these, you know, and so I, I look, I, I don't, I don't begrudge them, but I think a threat to boycott, and I know it's really hard because there's such an effort to to get lacrosse into the Olympics. It it is one of the the major things, you know. That uh, you know, the and here's the irony of it all, right? The more and more we try to push international acceptance of our sport, the more and more marginalized we become in it, politically, and frankly, competitively. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to c continue to maintain even that that bronze level of competition in, uh, in the world games in the, you know, whatever internet, Pan Am games, whatever, uh, international athletic competitions uh, adopt the Olympics. It's going to be very, very difficult for us to compete at the, at the highest level because our population isn't growing enough, you know, compared to, to theirs. I mean, uh, it, it's just going to be difficult. And, you know, and again, I think with every year that goes by, that we have to fight a major battle just to get on the playing field, uh, a major political battle, it, um, it doesn't bode well for the future.
you know, we will always be, you know, look, we've got lacrosse programs on most of our territories that, you know, as soon as the kid's six years old, he's got a lacrosse or maybe even younger than that, I guess, um, uh, playing lacrosse, box lacrosse. And uh, and most of the most of us have schools that have field across in them uh, at the high school level. So our kids develop incredible stick handling skills, ball handling skills um, at early ages. Uh, and then then they've got to you know maintain their ability to run and their, and their wind and their conditioning to, to compete uh, at the field level. And, and like I said, every every year we seem to put um from you know just see another phenomenal athlete come from one or several of our territories at one time and we've got some of the best and you know and these guys will find homes in in the struggling um uh pro lacrosse circuit which isn't you know it's, it's certainly not as lucrative as playing you know basketball baseball or, or football or hockey but um uh it's it's hardly um what i would call a full-time career for many of them but we still demonstrate, you know, our incredible athleticism and our commitment to the sport. I mean, the reason that we can compete at such a high level is because we are, as, as Haudenosaunee people, committed to the sport. We're, we're committed to putting our best foot forward. We're committed to, to playing this game since, you know, since we were old enough to hold a stick. And, I mean, that's, that's why we are so competitive. And even as some of this stuff gets stripped away, Look, not all of our kids go to college. And even some of our best athletes don't go to college and play lacrosse. Some do. And, uh, um, and some of them do, do very well at it. But you know, playing college lacrosse doesn't necessarily preclude you from playing you know, at the international level. Um, it probably helps playing some college lacrosse because of that level of competition. But it's going to be it, – it, I'm, I'm worried. I, I'm worried that with each passing year we, of every cycle of international competition, it, we – look, we shouldn't have met – it shouldn't have been a battle this time. There was no border necessarily to cross. I mean, uh, the United States is, is around us. So when the United States is finally hosting the international games – and the passport issue is, isn't a factor. They throw something else in our way. And, they, and the something else they throw in our way is only solved by another team dropping out. That's problematic. And it can't continue this way. So either the problem gets resolved or it continues to degrade our opportunities to uh, continue to compete at that level. So... I wanted to address the uh, address the issue. Um, um, before I close, I do I do have to say uh, mention a couple of things. Uh, Red Fawn is uh, has been released from prison, so congratulations to Red Fawn, um, and I, I wish her the best going forward. Uh, yesterday, I wore my 9/11 shirt, otherwise known as the Get Over It shirt, um, and I posted something on Facebook, uh, raised a few eyebrows. Some people think it was insensitive to suggest. Um, uh, you know, my thoughts on getting over, you know, the whole never forget 9-11 thing. Um, you know, there's, there's so much about 9-11 that uh, still leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth in terms of cover up, in terms of, you know, how it was, uh, the United States wasn't prepared for it. How um, I have, you know, a dozen guys with box cutters could, uh, you know, could launch such a major attack against the United States if that's really what played out. Um and when you think of the loss of life uh, on 9-11 and how many lives were lost because of 9-11, because the United States waged war against countries like Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Iraq, um, it, um, it, it's, it, it's very, very troubling. And, you know, so when I hear people say we need to get over slavery, we need to get over genocide, we need, need to get over the massacres that are, uh, that are women and children and men uh, suffered, uh, the residential schools, um, you know, and even even the the modern problems that we face, the suicide rates and the missing and murdered Indigenous women, and so many. When I hear people say "get over it," our fights over mascot, oh, just get over it, but never forget nine eleven. That's why my official nine eleven shirt is my "get over it" shirt. So, um, yeah, that's that's all I have to say about that. Hey, I want to thank you guys for listening. Um, we will be back here uh, for Tuesday. And I uh, look forward to it. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.